News filtered in, as it often does, from various sources, people letting me know directly and indirectly that Mike Berlin, writer, artist, Infocom implementer, had died. Mike Berlin was one of the first interviews that I conducted for Get Lamp and was also somebody who I had dip in and out of my life for the next 15 years. I thought I'd take a few moments to talk about my experiences with him. And, of course, you can't talk about Mike without talking about one of the greatest love stories I've ever seen. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Jeff Atwood, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. There are some really fantastic biographies of the work that Michael Berlin did. I'll touch on it briefly, just in case people know him for one particular title or another. He had created a game, O.O. Topos, back in the early 1980s, while also writing science fiction books. And on the strength of that, Infocom had reached out to him about working for them, an implementer of stories. The idea being a writer would be a welcome addition to what had previously been people who were technical first and writers second. Across his relatively short time at Infocom as a full-time worker, Mike Berlin wrote Suspended an Infidel, creating two legendary pieces of software. Suspended, particularly, is a game that now sounds very interesting, but not the groundbreaking piece of work that it was at the time. You are a brain in a box who has been woken up because something's wrong with a space station. And on the space station, the robot that would allow you to remotely see is broken meaning you have to use six other robots to be able to figure out what's going on. And you have to negotiate where they are, what they can see of each other, and try to figure out the puzzles. Mike mentioned that Timothy Leary came to him during a game convention to say that he hadn't thought much of computers, but that Suspended had really changed his mind about their potential. And Mike told me this story during an interview that he conducted with me at the beginning of Get Lamp. I had finished the BBS documentary, and I felt that I had developed over the course of four years a lot of abilities and skills that could be used to tell another relatively obscure story. And before it all faded away, it might be worth it to try to do another production. After thinking about it, I decided text adventures should get that treatment. It's complicated trying to tell a technical story from a personal point of view. And the way that I always did it was to create a list of people, places, and events that I would want to cover. And I always go in different directions that are not always technical. Why talk about just a bunch of programmers and their games? Why not talk to writers who do similar things? Or why not look at the perspective of somebody who only played the games and never made them themselves? Talk to cavers who were part of mapping places that inspired the original adventure. And also talk to academics who had made it their career, or at least their dissertation, as to what these games meant. As soon as you start doing any research about text adventures, especially when I started, you inevitably find an essay called Down from the Top of Its Game, which is about the rise, lifespan, and death of Infocom. And once you start figuring out that Infocom is going to play a huge part in the story about text adventures, you try to track down implementers. And I'll say that... Throughout the production of Git Lamp, which was about 2006 to 2009, 
So many of the Infocom implementers and employees were willing to talk to me, were willing to let me ask them questions, and in some cases travel to their homes and interview them, people who others told me would never want to sit, people like Mark Blank, who they had all considered impossible to interview, who told me, well, I heard about what you're doing, and I figure you're it, so let's do this. And he didn't entirely like his interview, but he absolutely appreciated that somebody was trying to tell this story. But the first implementer, the very first implementer I interviewed, was Mike Berlin. I traveled down to Florida to interview him, resplendent with a whole range of high-definition camera equipment that had been very expensive and was very hard to work with, had all sorts of quirks and weirdness I hadn't quite mastered. I was truly at the beginning of this journey. Over time, I would learn what I would really want to bring and how I would really want to record things. But Mike and his wife, Muffy, were extremely patient while this single-person crew stumbled around, tried to figure out how to get the best shot for him, worked with the lighting that was coming, and generally helped me make those first few halting steps into what became Git Lamp. Mike Berlin worked for Infocom for a relatively short time, like I said. But what I mean is that he worked for them for a short time as a full-time employee. Within a short time at Infocom, and with a game or two under his belt, Mike asked the company to hire his wife, Muffy Berlin, to join him, because in his words, she was a co-collaborator on all of his works. She was as important to the final work as he was. The company, citing not wanting to hire families and some sort of cloud of the idea of nepotism, refused. His solution was to quit Infocom, start an outside consulting firm with him and Muffy, and then get Infocom to hire them as consultants. It was that company that created Fublitsky, one of the games that they worked on, and that company went on in various forms to create a whole other set of works over the years. Mike Berlin was prickly to deal with sometimes. He did not appreciate people glossing over history, making things seem different than they were. I came into contact with that a few years into the production of GitLamp when he called me and said that he wasn't really sure he wanted to be in the movie anymore. Naturally, I had been building things around him, and I didn't want to lose that. So I called him and said, well, what what exactly is the problem, Mike? I remember driving down the road and having this discussion with Mike, where he explained to me that he was very concerned that he would talk rosily about Infocom, but that he'd actually had some real run-ins with management. And in his words, I don't want any clips of me making it seem like Infocom management was responsible for success or that they ran things the way they should have. I want to talk about how great the work was that we did, but I don't want to make it seem like I'm endorsing the way we did it. I immediately struck a deal with Mike Berlin that I had struck with Dr. Ripko and a number of other people in the past. I would make sure that there was sign-off, thumbs up or thumbs down, as to their appearance in the final work. Not a case of them being able to dictate the editorial content, but that long before we were locked into a final episode, I would send him that episode and he could look at it and let me know whether or not he felt comfortable being a part of it. I was very careful in how I edited his interview together. That interview, by the way, was wonderful. It moved between cynicism and joy. It talked about things that he thought were done really well and things he thought could have been improved. And ultimately, Mike saw the final episode of Infocom and the appearance in Git Lamp and felt that it was fine, which was a wonderful endorsement of faith in what I was trying to do with that project. In the years after Git Lamp, 
I would sometimes interact with the Infocom people. In some ways, I feel unbelievably blessed, really privileged in some of the interactions, having a pizza lunch with Mark Blank and his daughters, or seeing people at Steve Moretzky's house during an Oscar party and running into various Infocom folks who had both been in the movie and not in the movie, and just seeing old friends interact. It was at these parties that I would see Mike and Muffy together, and over time, I started to craft the opinion, one which I haven't really changed, that here was one of the greatest love stories i would ever seen. They'd met when they were very young and ultimately spent the rest of their lives together, collaborating, working, trying different schemes, ideas, investments, traveling around primarily tropical or warm climates to live and find their own place and ways to build a living and a life together, and just generally being true partners in every sense of the word. It was magical and inspiring to watch them talk together. Mike was involved in the creation of Bubsy Bobcat and the Bubsy series, He was doing mobile apps and various types of games all through his life, all different attempts to strike it big. And over time, I've realized that the games industry is not just tough. It's brutal. It's debilitating. You can spend years putting together a great game or a surefire hit only to watch it wither on the vine due to completely arbitrary reasons. One bad review or one strange regard or confusion between it and another title. And so it's very hard to judge what are great games and what are games that never got a chance. But what mattered to me was that the Berlins worked to try to do games forever, always taking one more bite at it, always taking one more attempt. Now, there are a whole bunch of biographical details that I could fill the hours with about Mike and Muffy and the projects they were involved in. But luckily, thanks to people like the Digital Antiquarian and all of the interactive fiction fans, Mike Berlin's various attempts at working with interactive fiction and all these other genres and outside business interests are beautifully chronicled. There are stories about him everywhere. But if I set you on that path, let me tell you that when Mike Berlin entered my life, I was at a crossroad about whether or not BBS Documentary was going to be a one-off, the only thing I did that would have any note. Maybe that was the one time that I stuck my head above obscurity and I was going to have to go back to a series of boring, uninteresting, uninspiring jobs and occasionally mess around with subjects I cared about. But his encouragement and his wishing the best for me in trying to set off on a new direction with telling stories stayed with me up to the present day. If for nothing else, for none of the other generous things he did, for none of the other games and books and songs that Mike created throughout his life, I would be thanking him just for that. So thanks again to Mike Berlin for being a part of this ride. Thank you for the gifts you have given us. And thank you so much for saying yes at a time when people had no reason to. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Craig Talbert, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, Martin, Sembiance, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere, who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. A few years later, Mike contacted me to let me know that he had a whole pile of archives of all of the work and notes that he and Muffy had done over their career, and they were shifting locations and they wanted to divest themselves But who would take it? Was there anyone I knew who might be able to provide it a home? And I said, 
there's always the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. Within a short time, I had those two parties talking, and the Mike and Muffy Berlin archives are now in Rochester, New York, available for researchers, for historians, and for the memories of what they worked on. One of the really nice side benefits of all this was that the Strong Museum of Play paid for all of the transferring of the materials. It literally took away any resistance that Mike and Muffy might have had in having to pay money to donate. They had all of this work preserved and ready to go into the hands of an organization that they could trust. I'm glad that at the other end of his life, I was able in some small way to ensure Michael's legacy and the work he did with the love, the true love of his life, is preserved. 